I want to welcome everybody to our latest edition of Meet a Nose, which is a series where we invite the most interesting thinkers in the field of scent to talk about their experiences. We use the term nose a little bit ironically. Everybody has a nose, just some of us use it a little more than others. So for this session, we're welcoming Simon Constantine. Simon Constantine began creating perfumes in 2007 for the global international beauty giant we all know as Lush Cosmetics. In 2010, Simon founded uh, Gorilla Perfumes, along with some of his family members within Lush, as an artistic showcase of his love for music and the arts. As Lush's head perfumer uh, and the head of ethical buying, Simon's passion for developing supportive partnerships and looking beyond sustainable sources has been the core of his approach to perfumery. Uh, this continues in his new perfume brand and fragrance, where he uh, continues the work he started at Lush by focusing on the ingredients and supporting the communities where they come from. So welcome, Simon, to this, uh, this online program. And I want to start just by asking you a very easy question, which is what got you into making fragrance? What were your first experiences? I think it probably, I mean, I think my first fine fragrance I made around 2007, um, which I think was Breath of God. But before that, I've been um, making a lot of product perfumes at Lush. And um, my parents are part of a sort of founding team of Lush. So I've always been around cosmetics, essential oils, and perfume in one form or another, um, ever since I was born, basically. Um, the, the house, when I was little, the house was a factory um, oh, yeah. for the first three or four years. So that was always, that's my earliest memories of kind of mum making soap on a gas ring, you know, hob in a, in a shed. Wow. So, um, yeah, so it, it's always been, you know, that, that kind of has always been around me. Um, however, I think uh, the journey kind of started for me when I started work for the for Lush properly um, at first because bear in mind Lush was a much smaller business sort of it would have been 18 18 years ago um, I just needed some a bit of money and it was mum and dad's company and I didn't really think much of it and dad suggested I, I work in the fragrance department which was very small and it was all self-taught he'd been teaching himself a bit of perfumery I'd helped him out a couple of times um, with some concepts when I was at art college and I was in that in that sort of space where you don't really know quite what you're going to do with yourself and so I started working in there um, and quite quickly I think there was conversations with dad but just in general um, I started to get much more interested in perfume right from the outset. Um, I was very interested in the artistic expression through fragrance I thought that was sort of overlooked um, and I got really interested in where materials came from that you could make perfume from. So those two things started quite early on. And then I, I sort of practiced basically just by manufacturing. So I was in the factory and that was a really nice place for me to be. I enjoyed it. Um, yeah, so that was kind of, that, that set me on the path, if you like, to, to where yeah, I am now. It, it's interesting because a lot of people who come to perfume don't have the context of working for, you know, a big, I mean, what became a very big brand. So in a way it's sort of ideal, but in a way it must have been quite a bit of pressure, you know, to, to, to be sort of playing around and making mistakes in the context of this company. I, I don't know, maybe. Actually, I think it was sort of, there may, they, there was pressure, but actually in retrospect, especially because I've, I've been out of Lush for nearly a year now. So it kind of had time to sort of look back a little bit and kind of see what, you know, it grew up around you at the same time. Yeah. So, you know, it, it wasn't, there wasn't a huge amount of pressure um, when it came to the to the product creation and, and formulation. It grew very organically. It started with, you know, just having a play for you know and putting it in a, a Christmas product, and and that was short term. You know, that could go into a, a ballistic or bath bomb or into a shower gel for a bit of time, and 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 that would sell for three months and disappear. Hmm. So in actual fact, it was almost the opposite. Uh, it, it was almost a bit kind of a lot of trial and error. Um, there wasn't a huge amount of pressure in terms of hitting the commercial level every single time because the, the business model for Lush was quite a high turnover product. The pressure okay. came keep, keeping up, you know, right. and, and you sort of, so you, you got to play a lot, but you had to, you know, have to keep that and that's, that's always continued. So in a weird way, yeah, it wasn't about pouring your heart and soul into one particular fragrance at that point. 
it was more about trial and error, lots of experiments, lots of mistakes and, and um, learning as you went. So I quite enjoyed that, to be honest. It meant you were, it was, I found it more expressive than um, when I was at art college. I found that um, when I was at art college, it was, it was restrictive. You had certain ideals and, and aesthetics or whatever it was that people expected of you. With the perfume, suddenly you could just play and no one really, you know, no one's language is particularly, you know, in general, in the general public, their language around perfume isn't particularly well adapted. So you could kind of get away with. Yeah, stuff. I totally, I totally know what you're talking about. And I also went to art college and I also had this right. experience with perfume where I was like, oh, well, this is, you know, where did you go to art school? Um, it was, it was locally. So in Bournemouth in, in the Bournemouth. South of England. Okay. So, um, yeah, it was a, an arts institute at the time and I, I dropped out of school. Um, so I should have been staying on for my A-levels here. So between 16 to 18, I, I should have been doing that. But um, at that point, somebody made the mistake of telling me I didn't have to. And I thought, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> and I left. And it, within three weeks, I'd left. And I went to art college. And I, so I, I did that for, for two years. Um, I, you know, I enjoy, I enjoy art and I enjoy, I still do some drawing and things like that. But in terms of express, expressive acts, I've, I've found that perfume was much more fulfilling. Yeah, and, it's your medium. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's a little bit, actually, it's kind of annoying because your subconscious, I find it, it shows a lot more in uh, when you sit at the perfumer's organ kind of thing. When you start making things, um, you could be thinking one very specific thing and you could be ready to construct this masterpiece and, you know, whatever you sit down and think. And then very quickly, uh, your subconscious is like, no, and it picks these materials without you realizing it. Um, and, and if you're doing it right, you're going to go into that funny space, that zone. And then by the end of it, you're like, oh, oh that's, what, that's what I really wanted to do. <laughs> are there materials that you find you always somehow reach for despite yourself? I mean, are there some things that just always come up for you? Yeah, I, I, it goes through phases. I mean, in this last, you know, when I, I sort of began the creative process for the and fragrances, there, there certainly were themes. And I think as, I, as we gradually kind of release them, I think people will smell that. There are similarities maybe in a, a few of the, you know, they almost come consecutively um, in that there's a, an influence there that blends into the next and blends into the next. Um, and so that, you know, I've found that, yeah, there have been in batches of creativity, there are materials that you prefer. And, and I have this sort of strange, you know, sometimes I'll be really attracted to something, you know, lavender for a long time. I hated lavender. It smelled like wet dog. I couldn't work out how to use it. Every time I put it in something, I just thought, oh, no, it's just gone sort of, well, we said granny pants, you know, mm -hmm. it goes like sort of not, not particularly pleasant. And then a combination of things happened. The quality of the lavender changed. And I felt like, in, I felt inspired by the material. And then suddenly I did, um, I think Twilight is one of the, the you know, the, the best selling kind of lush fragrances that has Twilight's used in Sleepy. Um, and they've used it across a range of different um, products. And that does very well. And suddenly it's it slotted into place, but at the moment I'm not into lavender. So, <laughs> I mean, we we are entitled to change our mind occasionally, right? Yeah, I I, yeah. Uh, I often find that a lot of perfumers I know just sort of just despite themselves always reach for the one or two things that just for some reason speak to them. So it's interesting to hear it's the same for you. Yeah. Um, so so I mean, so you started learning to do perfume perfumery, uh, and you've described yourself as a self-taught perfumer, which is interesting because again, in the context of a company, being self-taught has a different meaning. Uh, so so what led you within within Lush to start Gorilla Perfumes? Uh, it was something I initiated in. I can remember it relatively clearly actually because we were um, there was a, a meeting in um, North America in Canada, um, and. I'd gone over and there was a group of us and I can remember um, my dad was there as well. And, and basically about a year or so before that, uh, they had wrapped up a previous um, enterprise, which was associated with the Lush. It was like the sister of Lush, which was be never too busy to be beautiful. Um, aside from the fact that it took so long to say it and read it and write it, it didn't do commercially very well, but it had been an interesting um experimental ground and i was missing a place to so i developed breath of god there and dad had developed dirty perfume for instance and a few others and it we were missing a a, a vehicle within lush to develop the fine fragrance aspect of things because 
when we said fragrance, most most of the time people just imagined it was the perfume that would go into the product, and that was where most of our creativity would go. And so I just had this kind of uh, brainwave one morning. I, I woke up quite early, and I was like, well, what if we tried to to create this kind of uh, um, vehicle, if you like? We'd been called uh, Gorilla perf Perfumers before, um, before we established Gorilla Perfume. So it was actually my my brother who, when I was out of the room, decided to rename us gorillas because we were hairy and big. Um, and so there was a sort of fun combination of looking for some vehicle to, to use to kind of, uh, to hone the craft, I guess, of a fragrance. Um, already music had played a really big part. If you go back through Luscious history, you can see that a lot of uh, song titles inspired things and, and music always was being played behind the scenes. It was the same at home for us, no matter what it was, it could be Massive Attack or The Cure, or you know, it could be all sorts of different, um, and very broad and, and far ranging. And um, to the point I can remember my mum getting angry with dad for playing kind of Vivaldi at 7.15 in the morning to get you us know, all- In fairness. Yeah, yeah <laughs> full blast. To get us, I think it was to get us ready for the school bus. Uh, oh so he kind of kept putting you know, like all these kind of crazy things on. Anyway, so music played a big part, um, obviously interested in art, and, and it was just there, suddenly it came together that, that we could do this, you know, and that um, every perfume could be like a track on an album um, and every launch could be a collection, you know, it could be a, a you know, like a, an album's worth of, uh, of perfume. So, and again, it suited the, the time at that point where there was a lot of, a lot, like we said, a lot of experimentation with things and it just gave us, it upped our game, you know, it pushed the perfumery from product into fine fragrance and, and I think people within the business didn't quite understand that, that there was a division in the way we approached it um, and that you needed, you know, when you were expressing yourself through fragrance, the end result uh, was different and it meant something different to a sort of commercial bent where you had to do a soap perfume and it needed to fit with that formulation and cost and costing and all that sort of stuff. Mm. So it really started as that as a sort of a little germ of an idea and we got back and um, just started to play with the concept. Uh, and build out uh, and built out the sort of volume one if you like hmm. um yeah and uh and then this this tag of gorilla sort of came with it and we we formed it from there so yeah it was and we did uh, i think we did four albums if you like four collections and then um I agreed with dad before i left that we would put that on pause for a while uh, and see what we wanted but it very much was like being in a band um you know, and it was kind of one of those where I've gone off to play the drums on my own for a bit. Do you know what I mean? And kind of uh, see how it goes. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. So, so tell us about what you're, what, about Anne Fragrances. I mean, it's, it's, it's founded on some ethical principles, which of course is so cool and refreshing and timely. So would you share a little bit about what those principles are? Why you decided to start Anne Fragrances like this? Yeah, I think that... <sighs> It was, it's a funny mixture, and this is what I mean about your subconscious. You know, I, I was sort of really, uh, the other big part of my, of my career and, um, and my work is really looking at the ethical ingredients side of things, understanding that, um, and that's also taken me on quite a steep learning curve over the years, uh, starting with just being fascinated by how ingredients are grown, being fascinated by other cultures, um, probably in a sort of exotic way, coming from a quite boring county in the very arse end of, of the UK <laughs> you know everything seems different and exotic and wow you go to Turkey yeah. and you see this and Tunisia and you see that and and, and India and places and then quite quickly realizing that there's a um, there's a common theme both to human beings and that there is a lot more that uh, joins us than divides us and, and all those kind of um, uh, kind of sentiments but also that over time uh, ecologically I, I had I've had some really incredible teachers and, and learnings and had these amazing opportunities um, to go and see where materials come from a lot of them perfumery materials understanding that um, you know the impact that that can have and then obviously realizing the kind of peril that we're facing if we don't um, adapt the way we treat the natural world yeah. and yeah and and so that it, it kind of was sort of bubbling up in me and it really I think the final part of that was going to Somaliland um, you know last year uh, Somaliland several times has been sort of earmarked as the case study for the effects of climate change 
um, you know, incredible people, incredible um, culture, amazing landscape, very difficult to, to traverse. And, and we were looking at the sustainability and longevity of frankincense. Um, but also you could see that things weren't right. Um, things were not right. The, uh, the nomadic or semi-nomadic um, herds people that kind of, uh, that would normally be with their cattle and with their, their livestock moving quite you know, frequently across the landscape, they have suffered three to four years of drought. <laughs> many, of their, many of their herds have died as a result. Wow. So they were then um, classed as internally displaced refugees. So they don't show up as refugees, but they wow. are basically, you know, a large proportion of um, the Horn of Africa actually um, are, are internally displaced um, refugees. So they're in these informal camps, very little access to healthcare and um, different provisions. Uh, we visited some camps and um, yeah, it was, it's just, you know, as always with those things, it's incredibly shocking and you go through that, oh, wow, how lucky we are, blah, blah. But it's, it was deeper than that. It was we're all headed here yeah um, you know that we went to um the uh, there was a series of caves discovered uh, recently i say recently in the last 30 40 years um that were um 10,000 year old paintings of of herds people with their cattle they think it was one of the first places that that men uh, the men man yeah, mankind, um, whatever, yeah. humans uh yeah. domesticated cattle and yet now 10,000 years later there's a real risk that that will be the end of that because of the changing climate and whether that's just a pattern that, that will change again or whatever it is it's shocking to see and you can see the effects it has on people and you can see that around the world the the resources available to be deployed to um, remedy that they're not being deployed correctly mm. uh, you know that you know there are these pockets of of humanity that are living incredibly comfortable um, lifestyles and there are pockets of humanity that aren't uh, and we are i think the, the best way i could describe it you just have that sense of being out of order and in the truest sense where you know there is an there is a natural order to things and we have stepped way beyond it we are using yeah. and consuming and um uh, polluting at a rate that is not uh, sustainable so it all kind of you know sorry to go a bit deep but it, it all no, kind of it was bubbling up and and um, and I and I've been very fortunate in having either seen or having the opportunity via Lush and, and the resources there and outside as well to have been in contact with people who are looking for a solution to that and working out how, how that can uh, how we can let that play out. And I think that the world of perfumery hasn't really thought about that or addressed it in any way, shape or form, not in a deep sense. Um, that's not to say, you know, there's plenty of other industries that also need to address things. But I think that perfumery, well, we know um, it's a big industry. Fine fragrance is a, is a big industry. I know, it, you know, there's a lot of niche perfumeries that maybe don't have an impact, but there are several very large perfume houses that do have an impact. They're very profitable. Um, and what they choose to use and what they choose to spend their profits on, I think we should at least use and as a little bit of a poker to say, look, you can do more. Um, you can be part of the solution here, not just, you know, perpetuating the, the business as usual kind of thing. So, yeah, so I had that sense and, and that's why I've sort of chosen to highlight and, and work with the, the ingredients that I've picked because they represent to me several things. One, um, I really like connecting people through perfume and ingredients. So I like being a kind of conduit creatively but taking these exquisite materials and then using them to connect you as an individual to a community and to an ecosystem um, that right now, especially, you're probably not going to be able to go and see. Um, and so, you know, uh, and it, it's just timely, I suppose, that our, you know, our freedom of movement has just it's come right down. Uh, these were remote places to begin with, but now, you know, it's going to be a while before you can go and see um, and, and connect with people. Um, the second part of that is I've, I've a preference for those sort of communities. So indigenous communities in particular, um, whose way of life and connection to the natural world probably provide the rest of us with a bit of a template of how we should be living. Um, they haven't broken that order, uh, you know, in, in great part, but they're under a lot of pressure. As we know, indigenous communities don't, 
you know, they're not looked after. Um, we take the Kayapo in the Brazilian Amazon. Uh, that's why we started there. You know, at the moment, they, you know, they've suffered epidemic after epidemic since being colonized. So for them, COVID-19, it, it really presents a, a huge challenge for them. But they were already fighting a lot of illegal deforestation on their lands and just to maintain their own ecosystem, their own home. So, yeah, so I, I can go off for ages on this. But I mean, you know, that, uh, that's what I'm kind of passionate about. And, and that's what Anne's about, really. Yeah, well, I mean, well, these are important topics and weren't going off for ages about, you know, and, and yeah. I find it, I mean, you know, from, I have, I have sort of a bird's eye view of, of the independent industry, you know, uh, because of the Institute being a nonprofit that services, you know, the independent industry. And I do find that um, everybody has their sustainability statement, but it's one thing to support and it's another thing to build the company on it, you know, and I've been struggling with this myself, like, how do we make change in the world and still be in a field that produces product. You know I mean? We're producing yeah. product. We're producing more product for the world and we don't need more product. So, uh, and it's not, you know, I'm not expecting an answer from you. I'm just, I'm just empathizing with the question, you know, like, yeah, well, I, I mean, my only thought, yeah, well, just, I, yeah, I understand it's not a question, but I just think my only thought on that is that we're all wrapped up in this together. You yeah. know, there isn't a way, there isn't a, an easy way out. There isn't any one group of, of people that is perfect even when i'm talking about indigenous groups or anything else it's, of course it's just we're gonna have to work it out and um you know because I, I have the same sort of feeling it's kind of oh good it's another white man telling us all what to do blah 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 and i i don't want to do that either you know I, I was like well my skills are as a perfumer um i'd like to use those to initiate a vehicle but I'm not overly, you know, it's not enough even for me at the minute, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it's great. We've got this potential, but in my mind, it could go a lot further and it would be lovely for, for the benefits to be much more balanced and, and, and kind of addressing these deep issues. Like you say, not just a statement of intent and a, a yeah. few nice sort of platitudes and move on to the next good cause, but to mm -hmm. actually root yourself in a solution based approach. Yeah, and I feel like I feel like the 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 second part of that is to then succeed, and show that you can succeed with these solution based approaches. Because I think that's one thing that the you know maybe bigger companies they say yeah we can do that, but then you know the capitalism will fail. You know, uh, and I, I feel like the best thing you can do is do these things and and kick ass at it. You know, <laughs> and show actually this is sustainable also economically because we are in a capitalist system. You know, so sorry I didn't yeah. have, have to go there. I'm sorry, but. Um, no, it's true. It's true. This conversation I've had with the with the various suppliers and community groups, you know, is just saying, look, you know, I have to manage expectations too. I can't promise that all of this is going to be commercially viable. Right. Um, you know, it's it's something that I, I really hope and I believe in. But um, you know, you you just don't know, do you? And a business is a is is fickle as well, and it it's not always perfect. So, yeah, I'm very hopeful, but. I have to, you know, I'm managing the expectation and, and that's another mistake that I think has been made in the past is to promise too much and not deliver. So yeah. sing it. Totally agree with you on that. So you're working with the Kayapo now for, and are there, what's your plans for and fragrance? So what's your next sort of, I mean, what's the trajectory of the company for you? Do you have any new releases or what's. Yeah. Um, the so the, the lockdown period has been quite a challenge as you can imagine. Um, prior to that, we were kind of warming up to to launch, and then uh, a series of uh, things. Obviously, then everything comes to a grinding halt for a moment. And then I spent a bit of time thinking, um, and we I chatted with you know with various colleagues about is it the right time? You know, like you know, are people going to be interested in something that arguably is a bit uh, frivolous, like fragrance. People can often tarnish it with that. But I obviously don't believe believe it's frivolous but you know people can say that and uh is that the right thing to launch in the middle of a global pandemic when people are doing you know all these other frontline jobs and so i sat on it for a bit and then actually especially when i heard from the kaipo that um they were particularly worried about covid19 and in fact one of their elders within the kaipo have, have passed away sadly in the last um week or two from covid19 so when I heard that, I thought, well, I haven't got very much, you know, I've got a few bottles and, and enough materials to make a hundred of these perfumes and that could raise some money and get us started, you know, get, get a, and also I felt like it was a nice 
statement of intent for the brand you know we might not have everything set up in exactly the right way and there's plenty of work to do but we can show that actually as our first commercial activity um we'll put this out and we'll we'll support the people who are supporting us um which we truly believe so that was really the the beginnings of um you know you know that was the first step towards this sort of deep partnership um with the kaipo and then the there are four other fragrances that are formulated each of them with a kind of hero set of ingredients or ingredient, um, each picked in that in that same kind of guise. Um, there's uh, sand will be the next one available in a very limited capacity. Um, I think we've got 50 bottles that we can do in the next couple of weeks. I'm just waiting for my friend who's doing the website to build the web page, um, uh, and and then we'll and that will use sandalwood from West Australia which is um, in Aboriginal held territories and it's a part owned or jointly owned um, enterprise with um, Australian and Aboriginal Australians. So yeah, it, that, that should be really interesting. Sorry, I've got a fly just coming. No, it's okay. It's, it happens. Uh, that, yeah. So that one should be, you know, that one I'm, I'm looking forward to. Um, and then after that, uh, we'd work on uh, the other three fragrances. One is, uh, uses the Great Bear Rainforest, <coughs> Great Bear Rainforest in Canada. Um, it's one of the largest and last sort of temperate rainforests. Uh, it was branded as uh, it's a, a sort of trademark. I think we even have to use the, the TM because wow. um, they were. Uh, this is a group of uh, NGOs such as Greenpeace and the local um, First Nations, desperately struggling against clear logging coming into the region. They have the Spirit Bear. So this is this white bear, um, so it's emblematic of the, that area. And uh, incredible place, I have managed to get there. It was a little bit, it was one of the more difficult places to get. Canada is more in inaccessible than you realize. You got yeah. stranded. Two I've flown days. over Canada and looked down and gone, my God, it's like wastelands yeah. of, you know. Incredible, incredible place. And we spent, yeah, got, we were stranded for a couple of extra days there. Oh, man. Um, but there's a there's a, a small but um, kind of poignant essential oil distillery that they've um, created there because again First Nation community, um, you know, unfortunately similar story in terms of dispossessed from their their native sort of title and um, heritage. So they're gradually getting that back. But the communities that um, that remain are you know there's a big problems with unemployment and and um, and the things that are associated with that. So they created this essential oil business and um, will be using some of those essential oils in uh, the perfume which is called Bear. Um, and then uh, frankincense in Frank from Somaliland. Um, still working on um, a kind of potential fundraiser there as well because um, the, there is a risk that uh, frankincense trees are overtapped because of the, the economic pressure and then you, you're almost sawing the, the legs off your own seat if you like because then those trees could potentially die and disappear so there's a real um a real need there as well to boost livelihoods and, and to look after the the environment there uh, and then the final one will be mad which is using vanilla from madagascar again supporting agroforestry systems um so the one of the interesting things about all these fragrances is i haven't and i this is where I probably have been a bit stupid, but <laughs> I hadn't thought this through. I went with my gut on all these materials and I was like, okay, each one of those is what you could describe as a, a non-timber forest product. So they, they help establish or maintain existing forest. Um, you know, tonka comes from Amazonian hardwood tonka tree that requires or is best off in, um, in a, a healthy Amazon rainforest. And it's the seed from that. Or the bean that's why we call it bean mm -hmm. um the sandalwood is uh from deadwood trees so they've already died so they're, they're they're harvested after the fact on aboriginal land um frankincense comes from the tapping of trees so you don't need to kill the tree if you look after it properly and vanilla is a vine that grows well in and underneath trees so it fits into what we call an agro forestry system so all of these are not classic perfumery materials to start off your brand with they're not rose jasmine tuberose oh, really yeah, yeah. you haven't done any flaws uh which i now in retrospect think oh well, <laughs> i hope everyone likes this stuff 
<laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think, I think, uh, like, there's plenty of rose perfumes, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Just, yeah. Um, uh, and, and we are uh, going to talk in, a, okay, uh, sorry, there's a question, actually, maybe I'll just ask this question on Kathleen's behalf. So, so, and I was going to bring this up later. So you obviously have an interest in sort of the world and, and the planet and plants and sustainability uh, on a very core level. How does this play into this new permaculture garden that you're that you're growing and i'm so jealous by the way <laughs> uh well that I mean, the, a series of strange events i guess you could say because um about two years ago now i, I was able to take uh my young kids there they were probably eight and six at the time um and and my wife we went traveling for about six or seven weeks um and we went all over uh, southeast asia we went to mongolia we did all sorts of crazy fun things and it was amazing um and what, during that time my mum and dad were and they've been looking to to buy a bit of land and and to kind of find somewhere to to put their money into uh, as a nature reserve because they're long-standing you know naturalist conservationist and very interested in bird watching um and it, and it had been well over a decade that they've been looking for somewhere and then I, I got a message saying, oh, we found a place. We quite like it. We're going to put an offer in. I was like, okay, that's lovely. Really excited. Came back, realized it. it's actually out the back of my house. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a piece of land. We, we live slightly rurally, so we can walk out on, out the back of our house onto some, um, onto some fields. And if we walk for about 10 minutes, we're suddenly trespassing on, which I have done before we bought the place, onto another piece of land. And, and that was... That was like, okay, that's really strange. Um, Dad said one of the reasons he wanted to buy it was because there was a sculpted orangutan in the, in the gardens. There was an old tree stump that had been sculpted into orangutan. Uh, and one of the big projects we'd done, and I, I'm a trustee on Sumatran Orangutan Society's board. Um, and so we've worked for a long time on palm oil and around orangutan. So it, it kind of was this, oh, well, we must buy it because it's got this sort of thing. Um, it turned out that, yeah, and it turned out that it also had um, a defunct and quite decrepit, hidden, three and a half acre walled garden. Wow. Um, yeah. So, uh, so it, then it was kind of like, okay, so one of the other strands of, of my life in terms of the ethical ingredients was um, about eight years ago, uh, fell into, I got to this place really, it was around palm oil debate, so not so focused on fragrance, but it will come back, I, I promise. But um, looking at, at palm oil, I think most people now are quite aware of the fact that palm oil, um, you know, it requires the deforestation. Conventional palm oil requires the deforestation of uh, tropical tropical land. So, uh, and especially in uh, Southeast Asia, especially in Borneo, um, uh, Indonesia, you know, Sumatra, and the islands where uh, orangutan are becoming more and more um, endangered. So, I'd looked at I'd looked at that and. I'd been out to see, this was shortly after the tsunami, 2004. So I think it was about 2005, I was in Banda Aceh. So I'd seen the impacts of tsunami event and you saw this impact of palm oil and you, you, know, you felt like the world was ending. You're like, oh my God, look at all of this stuff going on. Um, and there were people saying about sustainable palm oil and I couldn't see how it could be sustainable. And it really made me question the word sustainable. And then a friend, I was introduced to a friend who, uh, he brought along this whole new frame of thinking, which permaculture was kind of my gateway into this way of thinking, which um, is that sustainable isn't enough, is it? You, you know, sustainable, just the word sustainable. And in fact, uh, the guy um, who set up Cradle to Cradle, I can't remember his name now off the top of my head. I, saw, I was at an event with him a little while ago and he, he framed it quite nicely. He said, um, if someone asks you how your marriage or your uh, you were with your partner, your relationship with your partner was, and you said, "Oh, it's sustainable," uh, <laughs> yeah, it's people not, wouldn't feel like it. That's was not a good thing. thing. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> when he said that, you know, that to me, I, you know, that's why I borrowed that because I think, yeah, there's no better way of putting that in that you go, yeah, our relationship with the natural world is sustainable. Uh, you know, it's adequate. Uh, you know, none of that smacks of this is the best that it can be, and. So the, the term that's now being used a lot more is uh, regenerative, but it wasn't at the time. Um, it was just something that uh, we've discovered and, and had been going, but I just, we didn't know about it. So me and um, my friend, we, he, he was very steeped in, in 
both the activist world um, and also in permaculture. And he really started to teach me about it. And we started this sustainable Lush Fund, which we called the Slush Fund. Uh, and a slush fund, you know, is this illicit pot of money normally in a company that you'd use to do something illicit and underhand. But we used it to establish several small projects to see what happens if you push the boundaries a bit uh, on where your ingredients come from. What happens when you move beyond sustainable and into this new realm, um, which is much more life enriching. So the idea is that you're, you're adding um, diversity and fertility and you're you're constantly growing and evolving into a, a into a higher state which I much prefer you know and it, it does feel much more like you're in love with nature rather than in a sustainable relationship with nature right and so that that's the sort of that's where I went anyway uh, a very long way of coming back to the gardens is that I, I realized you know one of the things we did over those eight nine years was to establish permaculture demonstration sites in partnership with local people and I could never get it going in the UK. The UK land ownership is very difficult. It's a very entrenched kind of place. Um, you know, it's it's quite a small island. Land values are high. But there's also a real conservative nature to to how you're meant to treat the land and what you're meant to do with it. Um, and so having this opportunity to take three and a half acres and play with it and create what's now becoming kind of a, a, a hybrid of sort of permaculture and regenerative agricultural things, uh, techniques, and some aspects of the more, um, you know, so my florals are in the garden. They're not in my perfumes. Um, you know, the, the opportunity to create uh, kind of living perfumes, if you like. So there's a, there's a big wheel, we're calling it, um, which is surrounded by aromatic uh, roses. And then there's a Mediterranean garden that we're planting jasmines and citrus um, and other Mediterranean herbs, salvias and things that really, really kind of are fragrant. So there's, there's a, it's a real kind of mix and, uh, of those aspects, uh, but with a, with a grounding that this is a space that everybody's welcome in. Um, it's, a, it's a space to enjoy, but also learn and look at how food is grown where things come from, how they, you know, look at climate change adaptation and resilience, all of these kind of things are all under one roof. I would call it a regeneration station is my, my aim. It has the um, advantage of rhyming. Yes. It's like a song I'm title actually. Like, <laughs> regeneration <laughs> station. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, good. You write the song and I'll, I'll <laughs> no, uh, no, you don't want that. So yeah, I mean, uh, in fact, there is a website, yeah, Carrie's Secret Garden. Yeah. Um, and we, we're, you know, we were hoping to be able to open a bit earlier, but the lockdown is not yeah. about. So but, it will um, be public, though. You are going to be opening it to the public. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that we'll be with an aspiration to run courses and they could be anything, you know, uh, it depends on what people are interested in, because it could be from perfumery through to permaculture, you know, all of those kind of different facets. Super um, cool. Yeah, and I'm really, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And the fact that I can walk there from my house. I know, it's an added useful. advantage. <laughs> yeah, totally. No travel for this one. Yeah. Um, so, so, so are you, um, are you going to try to fold some of the, the plants and, and sort of approaches from that garden into and fragrance? I mean, I, and this maybe is a stupid question, but I just imagine you growing the plants that then you then, maybe that's your floral perfume, you know, it's like English roses from a regeneration yeah. garden, you know? My, my, what I expect will happen is what's happened before where, um, say we've worked with musicians before, I've worked with artists before, uh, filmmakers, and you tend to, it, I think people expect a linear process when it comes to creativity. So you do yeah. one thing and that leads on to the next and blah, blah, blah. But in actual fact, quite often it's, it's this thing that once you touch it, it's all on you and then you can't, do you know what I mean? So I, what I'm imagining is I've never really worked um, with gardeners before. But that's what this feels like. It feels like a continuation for me uh, creatively to work with gardeners and then uh, allow this place to sort of take shape. It takes a bit longer, um, but you, you end up with this kind of uh, tactile environment where I don't know what creative thing will come next, but I think you're probably right. Some inspiration will feed back in. Um, certainly the gardeners are very keen to bring in plants that I've never heard of and uh, mm -hmm. and smells that I've never smelled and uh, yeah and it's been really fascinating so far so yeah 
That's super cool. We did a similar project, uh, not similar, but we did a project where we planted a garden at a homeless shelter in South LA, which if you've been to South Los Angeles in the industrial area, it's about as dystopian as one can possibly hope for in this world. It's very depressing, you know? And, and the, the thing that I was struck by, which you're sort of touching on is this sort of time you're subject to time. It's not on your schedule. You know, it's the gar it's the plant's schedule and, and deal with it, you know, yeah. which is interesting, you know, cause we're so accustomed yeah. to mastering our, our time and our and nature, you know? So, um, I want to talk a little bit about your creative process just because a couple people have asked me privately, like, you know, so one question from Gina, uh, Gina asks what your creative process is by which Gina means, how do you build a fragrance after you get a target or an inspiration? Uh, you triggered a memory actually when you said about LA and, and homeless. So the last time I was oh. in LA, it would have been with T'Chawa Covington, who was the the guy who built his home in a tank um, in in Malibu. Oh yeah. So we did actually work. We partnered up with a, a filmmaker called Hal Samples, who'd worked with um, T'Chawa, and he relayed this incredible story, which already inspired a whole load of perfumes for me. Um, uh, which we did as uh, the final, yeah, the, the fourth show for Gorilla it was all around the, uh, the, is it the fourth show? Yeah, it, it all blurs into one, but it was all around the concept of home. So mm -hmm. I'd also been to Lebanese refugee camps and um, been made welcome by refugees and we had cardamom coffee, so that's where that fragrance came from. Um, and to Chower, who is an absolutely fascinating um, character. So there is a, a documentary available on YouTube, I think actually, um, on the Lush YouTube, I think under Samples of Society. Um, uh, and he's a fascinating character, um, amazing guy. And he'd made this home out of uh, an empty uh, water tank uh, underneath the homes in, um, in Palisades. Wow. So he was right on, the, right on the beach, right? very good taste. He, he picked the perfect spot. In fact, he had several, <laughs> several impromptu homes that he kind of, he occupied these disused um, spaces. And then he made them incredible. It kind of, it was kind of like a magpie, he just brought all these different elements together and they were living art pieces. And then as you re revealed in the, in the documentary, something happened where his art was challenged by another artist and the tank ended up getting taken away. Oh. If, you haven't watched, if you haven't watched the documentary, it's definitely worth a watch. Um, I'll see if I can find a link or maybe someone else can. Yeah, but let me look for it quickly while you talk. Yeah, it's, I just noticed it was on the Lush UK YouTube the other day and it's called Samples of Society. Um, there's a series Samples of, of Society. Okay. Yeah, there's a series of shorts um, that were all working with the homeless um, community, uh, most predominantly in the, U in the US. Um, and then hearing these sorts of this street wisdom and, and kind of using, using filmmaking to break that barrier that maybe you wouldn't normally have had these conversations or these experiences but how had managed to take you in there um and when i was with t'chawa he i stayed over at his flat because he's no longer in this tank mm. and he he would yeah he was quite a, an interested guy and he'd filled it with all these incredible things you go out at three o'clock in the morning on his rollerblades he's probably still doing it I'm sure he is. And he'll bring back an old door or a hammock or a, a mirror that he can do something with and all this sort of stuff. And he said at the time, um, oh, I was never homeless. I was just rentless. And my experience there, then I came back and I was like, okay, I'll make it to Chower inspired um, fragrance. And being inspired by to Chower meant that you had to incorporate some elements. For instance, he had a big cabinet and he said, oh, my, uh, my attorney brings me this every week and he opened the drawer on this cabinet and it was full of weed uh, <laughs> so <you know>. california <laughs> like what kind of attorney is that a californian <laughs> attorney you know we yeah, speak exactly. each other's in, marijuana here <laughs> in the uk we don't get attorneys doing that sort of thing no. and then um so you had a little element of that in there he liked to drink brandy a bit so you had a bit of a brandy and i sort of built the that fragrance then off of that experience and the, the beautiful concept of being rentless not homeless yeah. Uh, and his, yeah. his experience was not was challenging your kind of preconceived idea of what that meant so that that would be one aspect of and, and this is that art imitating life and, and, and that whole piece was very much like that um sometimes the creative process can be a bit more can be a bit more linear you can think oh, okay this would work and um it rarely is unfortunately for me it kind of you, you start off down this path uh you think you're going to end up somewhere and you end up somewhere completely different 
it can be as simple as uh, one of my first rose fragrance when we were talking about rose earlier um my daughter was very young i wanted to build a really uh, unique and special rose fragrance because her middle name is rose but also i was more focused on the material i really loved it and wanted to do something with it and when i'd finished it smelled like baby powder i hadn't meant to make it smell like that crazy but as a new dad i couldn't not do it so wow. it, it became that where it fused into one um so the, yeah it, the, it can take you all over the place yeah i mean but, but so when you're working like for your for and fragrances you know let's say taking you know uh frank as an example you know you have this very uh meaningful material that comes from a very complicated place and also smells lovely because frankincense smells lovely at least some of it does so how do you take that material and 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 build around that you know because there's a reverence for the material it's almost like you don't want to touch the material you know so how, how does that work how do you how do you approach that creatively i think that it, i probably couldn't have done it until now i think that before i took concepts and the material supported the concept um, this time around, it feels like I've gone inside out. Yeah. Where it was more about, okay, um, the experiences that those fragrances are, uh, and those materials had allowed me to build by in, you know, imposing these concepts on them, now I could actually use to support um, and, uh, and hopefully kind of lift those. And so I think, again, it's difficult to convey outside of smell the perfume because that mm -hmm. you can then you, yeah, you, you get can see it. where i'm coming from it. but the the really it was about taking that material not messing with it too much so it's kind of chefy if mm -hmm. you know it's kind of uh you know like getting very good quality material allows you to be probably a little bit uh you know lazier creatively because you've mm -hmm. got this incredible um material and then uh, each one of these fragrances really I've tried to design it so that it's um, there's an element of comfort to it before a lot of my fragrance even rentless you know they 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 can be a bit challenging or they can kind of be you know they can I, I can remember doing Lord of Goat Horn for instance um, you may or may not have smelt very exclusive fragrance because I've used um, a methyl sulfide in it. it was after a lot of people asked what's oh, I'd love to smell of the seaside um, but having come from a, a, a coastal town, the seaside is rotting seaweed. I was, yeah, I careful um, what you wish for, right? Net, pot, <laughs> yeah, all this sort of stuff. And I and I realized, you know, the dimethyl sulfide, obviously, um, uh, you know, it's the the that smell in concentrate. So I, a lot of goat horns, a very challenging fragrance, and it was deliberately so. It was a bit of a bit of a tongue in cheek, and also just, you know, I like to push the boundaries a bit. Um, however. This time round, I felt like that's not what I wanted to do and that's not the vibe I got from the world. I got that it would be much more sympathetic to create very warm, comforting kind of fragrances that were like a, almost like a comfort food, but were good for you at the same time. Because mm -hmm. um, I almost felt like for me personally, and that what I'd like to offer other people is a reassurance, you know, this yeah. feeling that actually we can, you know, let's just ground ourselves a little bit here's some solutions instead of running around with our heads cut off and panicking about mm -hmm. this you know like let's let's enjoy the simplicity of of really well crafted material and i'm hoping my creativity has enhanced that um that is not for me to judge that is definitely for you guys to judge and i'm sure you will but um <laughs> well, yes yeah you know that, that, that's, that, that's the spirit of it so. that's cool i mean that's really cool and i think that's a thing that we all need you know uh both on the the, the bigger picture side but also just we're all really stressed and anxious you know I mean, yeah so yeah it's nice to have a, a sort of a nicely intentioned comforting thing in the world so uh, thank you for that so are there any questions from from the, from the people, la gente, donde están? Please feel free to unmute, or I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question. We have about 10 more minutes with Simon. I don't want to keep him because it's probably around about coming up to supper time for him and his family. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I need lunch, but um, any questions, folks? Now is a good time to chime in, or you can ta uh, type them if you want. And I will reshare re the links right now here is i'll put the the end fragrances oops 
So here is actually Anne Fragrance's sort of mission, which I really like, Simon, I wanted to tell you, it's, it's, it's very down to earth. It's like you said um, something like, you know, I'll have to read it. I don't want to quote you badly. You said, let's be honest, we ain't going to change the world or, or save it on its own. We just make perfume, but we can make a stand, which I thought was really cool because oftentimes, especially in the fragrance initially, you get these sort of overblown statements of like, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. and it's nice to read something a little more um, human like that, you know? Yeah, I've been quite lucky because I've worked with a, an old school friend of mine. I've known since I was about, uh, must have been since I was about 12, 13. Mm -hmm. um, and he, you know, he went off and he's had a career in marketing. Um, and I think he got to a point, you know, where we were discussing, it wasn't called and at that point, it was just this, you know, I come out of Lush and I was like, I've got this thing, I can't quite nest mm -hmm. it. So, and I think him coming from a marketing perspective where, you know, I don't want to quote him, but, you know, he has maybe had to work with people that the product is not, super great and you have to do all this kind of bullshit to get it to this this inflated level um it's been quite nice to sort of work on an invert and you know and actually kind of i think he was ready as well so he's helped me a lot on you know on the the website and and kind of and creating like the name came from him and his colleague mm -hmm. um a lot of that stuff so it's been quite interesting for me to see how marketing again can be beneficial yeah. rather than this sort of over inflation like you say this i got a you know, there's nothing worse than a black and white advert with someone whispering over it with all the walls fall down oh God, and you think, you know? well, I don't know what that was about. And then the perfume totally. comes up at the end, like, you know, oh, and it's like, okay, like, buy that. Yeah, you buy, <laughs> uh, buy that. <laughs> you know, so, I have this experience. <laughs> yeah, and anyone, is... any marketing guy would know that I'm not going to be able to pull that off either. Uh, you, you know, uh, meeting you, you now, you, I can't imagine you being yeah, like, let's yeah. have some wind <laughs> in the, you know. Yeah. Uh, what inspired the name and though, by the way? Uh, well, this came from this conversation. We were trying oh, to find see. a word that kind of summed up um, what we were doing, and a few words came up. And one of them, I didn't like this word, right? And the guy, this, this uh, Chris's name and his colleague Chris, they came up with a word. Uh, it was three letters. I can't remember exactly what way it went round. Anyway, they're like, "This would be really cool," and it'll be. And I was like, "What does it mean?" And they're like, "Oh, in African." I was like, "In African, there isn't an African." Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And when I googled it, it meant toilet in Swahili. I was oh. like, "We're not going to call it." whatever this word was so <laughs> oh, we're like right i was like let's do something a bit closer to home what about you know something that at least comes from kind of um you know northern europe you know yeah. something that means something. and actually it, it was and this is you know where you're just joking around and then all of a sudden this word and came up um because it means spirit and breath and ghost in old norse and in part in old english in parts of england they would have used that word too that's cool. um, and it just felt like okay it felt very simple felt very straightforward um it felt like a a kind of plus you know it just slotted into place so like all all good things so yeah that's 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 a very good uh, story for the um somebody uh is asking if you know of other perfumers or brands caring for sustainability are there any sort of coalitions and i'm just going to quickly plug some friends of mine in san francisco who started the coalition for sustainable perfumery just for, just in the last couple months Oh, um, cool. So definitely everyone should check that out. But, uh, and then, uh, you know, um, Simon, do you have an answer to that too? Is there anybody else that you're, that you know of that's working in this way like you? I mean, some of these ingredients are not exclusive to me. So other, yeah. other companies are using those um, and have actually supported maybe more than I have, depending on, on what the material is and stuff. So I'm definitely not looking to kind of steal thunder and take no, credit no, of course. for what that other people have done. I think really this is about kind of going, okay, that's, you know, this is the bottom line. How are we going to increase that and, and, and do better? So, uh, you know, I'd love to see this become the, the next trend, but, you know, in a sustained and, and kind of meaningful way. Um, I think that, it, I think that we've got to look at ownership and how project, and this is the work that I also haven't quite completed. And, you know, how do you form beneficial partnerships? How do you share profits and in, uh, in when you're putting ingredients and communities front and center, how do you make sure that all the benefits flow evenly throughout that? Mm -hmm. All of that work I'm still to do, but I think that, um, yeah. And uh, yeah, do I know of any other perfume? I'm not actually as uh, up to speed on that as maybe yeah. you are, so as you say. If I ask, uh, ask base notes, so you'll <laughs> get an answer yeah. for a grant again. Um, Hi everyone. Um, yeah, so I was just thinking, you know, considering COVID and all, um, you're talking a lot about um, your move to making more, you know, comfort smells. 
what do you think, what would you say is the ultimate comfort smell if you had to pick one for this time? Uh, the ultimate, yeah. I mean, I, I like kind of gourmand perfumery and I, I've been attracted to that, uh, as many people will know. I mean, um, the one it really for me, the, the ingredients that I've picked, you know, the vanillas and the tonka and even the sandalwood, I find those very reassuring and very comforting, which is why I've been drawn to them in this time. Um, the fact that, it, you know, that it's a really nice synergy because they also have these great community benefits is, is a massive bonus. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it, it also depends what comfort is for you. Um, you know, it, I would say this with perfumery because different people have, you know, the different associations. In fact, it's always been one of the, the most exciting core pieces of perfumery is that ability to storytell and to transport people um, with, with fragrance. And so that means something different to everybody. Um, working with, okay, working with Hal on his uh, samples of society, what meant, what was a comfort to him was his grandma had just died and we could recreate the smell of uh, her linen closet. Now that isn't necessarily that comforting for everybody, but for him at that point, it really was. So very personal, I think, but yeah. But I, I, I guess, I guess what I mean is, I guess I, I agree with you. And, um, but I think right now, because the world is experiencing one thing altogether. So I wonder if you had to pick one smell, because I was thinking of trying to make some perfumed, uh, like, um, what do you call it? Those perfume trees to give to delivery drivers, you know, to give them some kind of perfume. Kind of fresheners, you mean? Yeah, 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 like, you know, yeah, um, perfume trees for the cars. Yeah, well, the, was, the little yeah. trees, TM. Yeah. Yeah. Not knowing people, like, like giving a perfume to strangers, if I had to yeah. pick one smell that would make everyone feel happy, like, I would have thought Neroli first, because that's, to me, an obvious one, but. Everyone, yeah, everyone goes with Neroli, but it never, it doesn't necessarily strike that chord as much as you think. So it does have a, an uplift. In fact, Rowena, one of the co-founders of Lush, her go-to, it was a running joke for 20 years, I suppose, with always, she always would want narrowly and grapefruit, narrowly and grapefruit, because that'll make you happy and smiling. She is literally the, the happiest, smiliest person in terms of constantly like in the positive and, and optimistic. So, uh, which I'm not. So it's probably better to go with her and, uh, and go with your gut there and do a narrowly and grapefruit blend. I would do that. There's your <laughs> yeah. answer. You probably well, can't go end. wrong with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My friend Bettina Hubby, who's an artist here in LA, years and years ago did a project where she, she interviewed all these construction workers in, in LA about what their happiest scent was. And uh, Donna, I'll send you that, that data because it was actually surprising. They were, they, were, they were going for things that you wouldn't expect like a tough construction worker to go for. So I'll share that with you. Um, all right, guys. Well, it's time and I don't want to keep Simon beyond uh, what we asked him for. Um, uh, so I'm going to, we recorded this video, so we will, uh, put it on the internet. So if you want to catch up with, 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 uh, some parts that you, you know, missed or want to revisit, you will be able to do that. And I want to sincerely thank Simon for his time. It's, it's I'm excited for your new initiative. And yeah, so the, the link is in the chat, but you guys please go and support it because new initiatives like this require support. So let's go support what Simon's trying to do for the world. And um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Simon. Simon, good luck. Thank you. Let us thank know how we can much. help. <laughs>